we as parts of God's body can become rather unhealthy. And so we're going to try to look at some things in the scripture that says, this is what makes up a healthy church. But there's also another problem, and that problem is, is that sometimes we think that everything is bad, and that maybe the church all across the world is unhealthy. In fact, if you look at statistics and you listen to some of the reports about the church in America, you'll hear that the church in America is oftentimes in decline. Did you know that there's 3,000 churches closing? That there's churches closing literally almost every second in this country? Do you know that, um, that, that the church in America in some ways has become stagnant? That 90% of the churches in America actually are not growing or they're actually declining? Okay, those are kind of bad news, isn't it? Now, what you really don't, Hopefully, you hope you're not in one of those churches that is declining, right? Or worse yet, one of those that's about to die. You especially hope you're not in one of those if you didn't know it. <laughs> or worse yet, if you're the cause, <laughs> right? But, but maybe we also need to be aware that God's doing some incredible things around the world. Did you know that 70,000 people come to know Christ every single day in Latin America? 70,000 every single day. Did you know that 20% of India is now Christian? It used to be 1%. Okay, that's pretty incredible. That Africa is considered to be a Christian continent, like America used to be. <laughs> that, that Europe, North America, and Australia, New Zealand, Christianity is dying. Than less, and that less than 20% are in a Christian church. That church attendance has been on decline for 30 years in America. And that with the 3,000 churches closing, we need 10,000 churches to keep up with population growth. Well, and some people think there's too many churches around. Did you know that the average church attendance for worship on Sunday is 124 people? And then 90%, as I said already, of the churches have already plateaued or, or are in decline. What's a healthy church? Well, first off, I think that God created a healthy church to be a missional church. I want to share with you some things that we, were shared with us at, when we were at the, uh, the Developing Healthy Churches Conference at uh, uh, Virgil and Daryl and I believe Chief Sherman and I attended a couple of years ago. In there, the gentleman speaking says, why is the church here? Is it to be a custodian for saints or a force to set captives free? Why is the church here? Is the church here to make disciples? Now listen carefully. Is the church here to make disciples or to love one another? Yes. <laughs> you see, there's an interesting challenge there, isn't it? If the focus that we have is to love one another, we will be a nice, close family and fellowship, right? But if our focus is to love one another, how many people are we going to allow to come in? And isn't the call of Jesus Christ his last words? Now, I know he told us to love one another. Okay, right? So somebody said, yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, we are to love one another. But if that's the main goal, we're going to miss out on the fact that God has call, called us and Jesus commanded us. Just before he ascended into heaven, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. He said to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And he said to teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And if you listen to what that commission has within it, there are some of the descriptors for a healthy church. <coughs> Let's look further. Did you know that, the, that a lot of what the Bible says about the body of Christ is about, has war metaphors in it? That we're on this sense of mission and we're supposed to have a seriousness in the mission. And that Jesus called us, in fact, he even said to, Jesus, to Peter, he said, Peter, I'm going to build a church and I'm going to build it on you and the other disciples and the other followers. And he says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Have you ever seen a church building go up against the gates of hell? Have you seen a church building go to war? 
Have you seen a church building move? Shake, rock, maybe an earthquake comes. I don't know. Holy Spirit jumps in there. But really, church buildings aren't the church, are they? No. But what's the church? The church is the people that God's called to serve him in a community. Now, I know we kind of all fall into it, don't we? Where'd you go this morning right now? Where are you? Church. You're at church, right? Well, are you? Are we at church here? Well, we've come together to a place that's called Crestline First Baptist Church, name out there on the sign, right? Is there a sign out there? Oh, yeah, there's a banner right there. It's Crestline First Baptist. So we're, we're, we're yeah, we, we, say, we say this is, but really, this is simply where the church of Crestline First Baptist meets on Sunday mornings at 1015. But this isn't the church. This is just a facility that we use, that we occasionally gather in. In fact, we don't even gather here that much when you think about it. Sunday mornings, yeah, we have small groups that meet here during, during the week, youth group even, ladies group, men's group, different things like that that happen here and all. Worship team practice here. There's things like that happen. And people come in here and there's, there's um, times that we pray with people here and all. But, but really, the, the church doesn't even come here very often, does it? The church spends a lot more time outside those doors than it does inside these doors. The examination of whether a church is healthy is not really what happens here. Well, you'll get a little clue, won't you? If you come in here and somebody says, that's my seat. <laughs> and then they don't say anything else. It's just wait, and so finally you move. <laughs> uh, that's going to tell you something about the, the people that are part of this church, right? If, if you come in here and people are like, why'd you dress that way today? <laughs> Now, unless they're your best friend, <laughs> you're going to get a clue about this church, right? <laughs> if you come in here and, and people like, are obnoxious and rude and inconsiderate, and, you know, and, and if people are like, God, come on, and not really believing that God exists and not believing that, that he responds to prayer and, and they don't live out faith and, and, they, and, and you're singing in a song, Oh boy, I'm so happy! And, and you're learning and they're like this. Okay, you know, we're, we can send all kinds of messages when we're here together, right? Maybe that's why we all sit with people looking at their backs. <laughs> Have you noticed? You come to a church building like this, you meet with, you sit down there, and what are most of you looking at if you're not looking at me? The back of somebody's head. <laughs> Unless you kind of move, you know, position yourself. Well, look, God, God can help us to see what his church is like when we're here. But the real examination of whether a church is healthy is what's out there and what we do out there. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13 says this, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. at this conference that we attended, the speaker made this statement. The number one problem with a plateaued church is that it is in deep disobedience to Jesus Christ. Did you know that the gospel of Christ never changes? It's been the same for 2,000 years, hasn't it? It's a very simple, straightforward message that Jesus Christ came in human form, lived here, taught here, performed miracles here, died on a Roman cross by his own choosing, suffered, gave up his life, and then three days later rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and before he left, left his church to continue to share that story that anyone who believes in Jesus will not die but have everlasting life. The gospel never changes. But folks, the church better regularly be changing. Act two, Acts 2 says the church met daily. In fact, they met for the first 200 years. Where? Well, they'd meet in homes. 
They sometimes met in local synagogues. They even came to the temple until, until just, what was it, 30 years later when the temple was destroyed, so it's not a very long time. Temple's gone in Jerusalem. So, so they uh, most of the time met in homes and in various public gathering places. Uh, but after that, this incredible man named Constantine I say incredible. Why? Because whether he committed his life to Christ or not, his mom did, and he, as the Caesar at the time, called all of the Roman Empire to become Christian. Wow. Now the challenge with that was, when you think about it, is this. Can I say this morning, just tell all of you, because you're sitting here, you're all now Dodge Chryslers. You just are. Or here, let's take another step. You all now are Hindu. Would that make you Hindu? No, it wouldn't, would it? There has to be changes that take place in your thinking and, and life and habits and all those kinds of things that have to change. And, and really, can anyone make you Hindu? Well, in some ways, I guess if you're born quote, a Hindu, right? And that's what you just kind of grow up in. You can sort of be made a Hindu. But really, now let's take it back. Can anyone be made a Christian? Can you even be born a Christian? No. Because you must come to that personal step of faith, which is a step of believing that Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead for you. So Constantine, yeah, it seems really wonderful. The whole Roman Empire is Christian. The world's becoming Christian and thousands of people did, but did they really? And along with that, he said, well, let's protect now this church because I've got interest in it. And so let's build buildings. And then we've got to protect those buildings. And so let's put people in charge of those buildings. And, and you know what? If they're going to take care of all the sacraments and all the things that belong to the church... They need to be kind of protected from everybody else. Let's call them clergy. And let's give them authority that's above everybody else. Because, you know, we can't trust the regular people, especially with the word. They'll mess up. Okay. And then for hundreds of years, we've gone through this process of where we've been putting some people up on pedestals as spiritually above everybody else. Forgetting, did you hear what this text says? That those who have spiritual responsibility for every else, evangelists, apostles, pastors, teachers, I skipped one, prophets, that they are all to do what? Equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so for hundreds of years, we've been challenged by this fact that we've thought that we're supposed to come and sit while somebody up there does the work. I mean, we talked about this, touched on this last week. That's why we hire pastors, right? We hire a pastor who's going to, quote, grow the church, right? They're going to bring people to Jesus. And, and yes, pastors should be able to help somebody to accept Christ, shouldn't they? Because if they can't, we're all in trouble, aren't we? Because the rest of us are kind of like, you know, well, I don't know how to do that. That's they're the professional, right? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says is that it is the job of the leaders to equip us all to do the work of ministry. <clears throat> Notice, it says, Jesus Christ gave us what? He gave us, first off, apostles. These are the people that were sent out. Now, originally, the apostles were the 12, which included the apostle Paul, right? He was the one that Jesus chose to replace Judas, remember, who, who uh, betrayed Jesus and, and then hung himself. And so in order for there still to be 12, he, he appoints. Yeah, I know, they appointed Matthias and, a couple, and thought that that was the way to go. But the disciples were told to pray, not replace, okay? And while they were praying, and then the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and eventually then Jesus calls the Apostle Paul. Apostles are sent out ones. They have responsibility to go out. They really are missionaries. They are church planters. They're the people that go out into other places and communicate the gospel, talk about Jesus to people who are far from him, who may be totally different culture and everything. Paul said, I'm an apostle to whom? He was a Roman and a, called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. That, by the way, that's most of us here. Second are the prophets. The prophets used to be, in the Old Testament, they were the people who told the future, right? 
They foretold what God was going to do. God would come speak to them and say, go tell Israel, I'm going to judge you. And then I'm, here's how I'm going to do that or something like that. Or, go tell them I'm going to bless. Isaiah talks all about Jesus and now Jesus is going to come. And, and so there's all kinds of prophecies about the future. A prophet foretold the future. But today, a prophet, listen carefully, forth tells the word of God. A prophet speaks out the word of God and how it applies to people's lives. Who should be modern prophets today? Preachers. Right? Shouldn't they be speaking the word of God forth to all of us so that we hear that word and then live and apply that word to our lives? So those are prophets. Prophets are ones in also who would then speak vision when they, and God's vision to God's people. In fact, isn't the, that part of the responsibility of a pastor? But really, it's a prophet. The leaders of churches should be prophets who help the people follow the vision of God, who pursue the mission that God's given to them and help and use the word of God to equip them to do that. Those are prophets. Then there's evangelists. And evangelists are those people that are spiritually and specially, uniquely gifted. They simply say, did you know that Jesus loves you? And you say, please, can I accept him? Right? I mean, they just, they have this unique ability in it. And seriously, it's supernatural. Simply to start talking to somebody and conversing with them, and they start accepting Christ. There are Billy Graham who did this with the masses, right? Who stood up and, he, and all he had to do was, play, he didn't even have to really speak, folks. All he had to do was play softly and tenderly and invite you to come, and you were coming forward. The, the evangelists have this unique supernatural ability. However, does that mean they're the only ones who get to tell other people about Jesus Christ? Uh-uh. We all have the responsibility, but some are supernaturally gifted. And the way you know that is you see results. <laughs> you see significant numbers of people coming to Jesus through them. Those are the evangelists. Now the last group, and some people would say there's two groups here, but the way the scripture in the Bible in Ephesians reads, it's really one, pastors, teachers. Pastors, teachers are those who care for and guide the sheep. They have spiritual responsibility for people. They're going to take time to pray for other people. You know, in a lot of ways, aren't parents pastor teachers? Aren't they trying to shepherd their little tiny flock of, the, of children, whether it's one or a dozen? I'm not sure which one needs more help, the, the, the spoiled one or the... Where's, who, who's the 13th, the, the 11th one? I, I don't remember where they were. But I, never mind. They all have this, as parents, have spiritual responsibility for shepherding. Who's the chief shepherd? Jesus Christ. He's the chief shepherd who takes care of the flock. And all of us are flock, aren't we? But then Jesus uh, helps us to break down into small groups. So if you think about it, who are the shepherds, the, the pastors at Crestline First Baptist? Who are the pastor teachers here? Well, let me give you a hint. There's a couple of them that are doing their pastor shepherding right now. And they're not on this floor. Okay? We have a pastor shepherd who's down working in the nursery with the little, little children. And guess what? Debbie's down there not just loving on those kids, but talking to them about Jesus Christ. Okay? Little ones, under five years old, who can't read. So she's using, yeah, flannel graph. I know, pictures, I know. But she's helping them see and learn about Jesus Christ, praying with them. Connie's over in the other building, um, working with them, do, helping them to worship Jesus right now. Dave and Karen, right? Now, you guys do, do, do two different age groups there, right? So Dave's uh, over with the older ones. Con Karen's with the younger ones. Did I get that right? Yeah, okay. Um, so those are some of our pastor shepherds. Oh, guess what else? If Paul's doing his responsibility correctly when he's working with the worship team, he better be pastoring them, shouldn't he? He should be shepherding them because if they get all focused on themselves or fighting with one another or performing on Sunday, we're all going to be in trouble because we're in a miss worship. Okay? But what about all of our life groups? Isn't Alan Russell and Daryl Davis, aren't they shepherds as they lead a small group and in their home? Oh, but what about this? Isn't 
Gail and Betty Sherman, aren't they, who are pastoring, taking care of the little flock of ladies that meets on Friday? Do you, do you see it, folks? Do you see this responsibility that, that those who have shepherding past are the pastor teachers? And that are in our life groups, that's one of the places where we are trying to help people grow closer to Christ, stay connected to Christ. We're trying to support them and minister to them. We're praying for one another. The, David, you have a Bible study in your home on Wednesday nights, right? Are you not praying for the guys that are there? Are you not trying to encourage the people that are there to come closer to Christ? Whoa, isn't that what pastor's teaching is about? See, our, I appreciate the fact that people use the title pastor with me and they, and they try to do that out of a sense of respect. It's funny when the little kids say Pastor Beal. But, <laughs> and I appreciate that. But there's a danger in that, isn't there? And the danger is that I get lifted into a place that's above the rest of you. That's like more important like I'm somehow more special than you are. And, and, and that's why if we're really going to minister to somebody, quick call Pastor Bill so he can do it. If we're going to pray over somebody, we need Pastor Bill here to pray for that person. If we're going to talk to somebody about Jesus, get Pastor Bill over here so that he can really touch their heart and tell them about Jesus. And what's the mistake we're making in all that? Is that God called us and Jesus gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, not to do it, but to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Amen. So who should we be calling? If we need somebody to pray, who should we be calling on? There ought to be a really loud answer right now. If we need somebody to pray, who should we be calling on? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that one and clarify it. You, if you need somebody to pray, should be calling on Jesus. <laughs> Get it? You were right when you said yourselves. Because you should be the one praying and calling on Jesus Christ. Now, I sure wouldn't mind an amen on that one. Amen. <laughs> So here's what, here's what the, those leader people are responsible for doing. We're responsible for equipping people for work. Yes. We're, we're, we're sent here to help you get excited and committed to serving Jesus. The word equipping means to mend or repair, to make whole or perfect. It's about setting a bone that's been broken. That's an interesting one. It, it's the, the word used for mending nets. When the, when the fishermen, they'd be there and they'd be sewing the nets all back together. That's work that, we, that we're supposed to do. And, and the leaders are to equip you for doing that work. The English word equip means to furnish for service or action by appropriate provisioning. What? Equip describes the supplying with the items needed for a particular purpose. Both of these definitions providing excellent pictures of the effect the gifted should have in the body of Christ. It's about fitting or preparing you fully so that you're ready to serve for the purpose which God intended you. We are called to equip you to work. What did Jesus say in John 4, 34? My food, said Jesus. The disciples have just come back and they went to get him food and he says, I'm hungry. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. So it is for us, folks. The most fulfilling thing for you is to be doing the work that God sent you to do. And Jesus went on in his high priestly prayer. He said, John 17, 4, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me. He's getting ready to go to cross. He's, he's, about, he's finishing it here. In fact, he will himself cry out, it is finished when the work is done. It's John 9, 34, when he, 3 or 4, when he says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so the work of God might be displayed in his life. You, by the way you live, can perform the work of God. John 6, 28, then they asked him, What must we do to do the works of God that he requires? And here's what Jesus answered. Here's where all work begins with Jesus. The work of God is this, to believe in the one 
whom he has sent. Your first job is to believe in Jesus. In Acts 20, Paul says his farewell to the Ephesian church. We're reading from Ephesians today, and, and it's, it's to the same church that he now will communicate goodbye to them. He comes to Ephesus, and he says, I'm heading to Jerusalem. He doesn't know what's going to happen to him, but what he believes is that everything tells him he's going to prison. And here's what he shared with them. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Now, most sane people would say, then, Paul, stay away from Jerusalem, right? No, he's being driven there by the Holy Spirit. However, Paul says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of what? Of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. These are people he really loves. He says, I'm never, I'm never going to see you again. This is goodbye, friends. And, and I'm, what I'm looking forward to it doesn't look good. But I'm going to serve Jesus all the way. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God. That's that word, by the way, that we usually translate pastors. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, listen to this one, after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. You have that same responsibility to hold to the truth, to shepherd the flock, and to take the gospel of Jesus to a world that needs to know God loves them. Bruce Hurt from Preset Ministry says that we are to equip you for work of service, literally spiritual service. Service for the Lord will, we, will require some expenditure of energy. Note, the pastor teachers are not doing their work for the saints, but are preparing the saints for their work. This is really radical thinking. The leaders are God's gift to the church for the purpose of perfecting or equipping believers to carry on this work. We seem to have forgotten that the church is not to be a spiritual rest home, but a barracks for the training of soldiers of the cross. So many today think that it is the job of the pastoral staff to do the work of ministry. This is not the divine design. All, each and every single one of the saints and not just a few church staff or leaders are to carry on the work of ministry. Who? All of us. And he, Paul goes on, he says, we're supposed to build up the body. And we do this until the body of Christ is completely built up, he says. Have any of you seen the, the commercial, the advertisement for the medication, just one? They walk in and they do one sit-up and then leave and one yoga move or something like that and, and then leave and, and one piece of, um, I'm so surprised they didn't use Brussels sprouts, but it's one, one asparagus or then eat that one thing and, and then and that's all you need. It's all about you get this one inoculation and you won't need any more. And that may or may not be true, but here's the fact. Can you imagine going to a bodybuilder and they do all the lifting? We're going to get a whole crowd together here and we're going to work on our heart. 
we're going to do make sure that we do cardiovascular exercise. And so we're going to start just running here. And, and, and the leader, and he's up there doing all the running and, and gets to the end of it and said, wow, didn't we have a good workout? <laughs> okay. When we fall into thinking that the leadership of the church are the ones who do ministry, we are going to a workout and watching them. And that is not the kind of bodybuilding God wants for us. God is calling us to be building up his body, which is all of Stedman said this, Ray Stedman. He kind of does a, a blueprint, a divine blueprint for, for building up the body of Christ. He said, when we compare present-day churches to the original blueprint, it is strikingly apparent that many deviations have been permitted which have been detrimental to the life of the church. Through the centuries, the church gradually turned away from the simple provisions which made it such a powerful and compelling force. In its early years, and terrible distortions entered into the church which continue to weaken the church today. Popular thinking fastened onto the church building, the physical stone and glass edifice, as the identifying symbol of the church. Emphasis was placed upon great imposing structures, massive ornate cathedrals with stained glass windows and flying buttresses. And, and Stedman's not saying those things are necessarily bad, but he says, when they became the church, we became unhealthy. In the beginning, working in the church meant to exercise a gift or perform a ministry anywhere within the far-flung body of Christ. You'd, you'd serve and do ministry in a home. You'd do it out on the mission field. You'd do it in a hospital. You'd do it on the streets of Rome as the church did. And because of that, people came to Christ. Working in the church, unfortunately, came to mean performing some religious act within a specific building which was called the church. By the way... Stedman goes on, he says, there was this gradual transfer of ministry responsibility from the people who are called laity to these others who are called kleros or clergy. And ministry left the hands of the saints and went into the hands of a few. May I remind you of what 1 Peter says? Chapter 2, verse 5. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He goes on in verse 9. But you, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Folks, do you hear the power of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit comes upon the church and God's people are doing the work of ministry? Stedman asks us, when was the ministry left to the professionals? There was nothing left for the people to do other than come to church and listen. They were told it was their responsibility to bring the world into the church building to hear the pastor preach the gospel. Soon Christianity became more than a little more, little, little more than a Sunday morning spectator sport, much like the definition of football. Today, millions will watch as 22 men down on the field will desperately be in need of rest. And millions in the grandstands will desperately be in need of exercise. <laughs> Pastors were never meant to do all the ministry. And what's happened is in the process of us believing that, is that we have people who are afraid to do the simple things that God's already equipped them to do. Again, back to Stedman, he says, we desperately need to return to the dynamic of the early church. We can no longer defend our ivy-clad traditions which leave no room for the original power-packed New Testament strategy. 
pastors particularly, must restore to the people the ministry which was taken from them with the best of intentions. Paul goes on. It's not only do we need to equip the saints for the work of ministry, but we need to build up that body until they all reach unity. And that's real unity in the faith. And incidentally, when we're talking about the faith, we're, we're, not, we're not just talking about believing. We're talking about the truths that have come out of Scripture. MacArthur says it this way. The ultimate spiritual target for the church begins with the unity of the faith. As in verse 5 of Ephesians, faith does not here refer to the act of belief or of disobedience, but to the body of Christian truth, to Christian doctrine. The faith is the content of the gospel in its most complete form. As the church at Corinth so clearly illustrates, disunity in the church comes from doctrinal, doctrinal ignorance and spiritual immaturity. Have you read Jude recently? That little letter right before Revelation. Jude says, We are to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And he warns us when that faith is getting distorted. Remember what Luke said? It's the first time that the term faith is actually used in the New Testament. It's Acts 6, 7. It says, So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now tie that back with the Great Commission. What did Jesus say? Go and make disciples and teach them to obey everything I have taught you. The children are coming back so that Connie is here in time for communion and so that those who know Christ can participate in communion. So, welcome back, kids. <laughs> Romans 8, 29 tells us that God's ultimate plan for us is to be conformed to the image of His Son. Is the ultimate goal the, of, of our church to evangelize people? Not according to the Great Commission. The ultimate goal is for us to help people become like Jesus Christ. Yes, that means they first need to come to believe in Him, don't they? That means they need to develop relationships with other people in the church. That means they need to start to grow in that relationship and start to understand what the truth of Scripture says. But the ultimate goal is for people to become like the Son, Jesus Christ. Folks, isn't that what you desire? To become like Jesus Christ? It's, all, it's, it's, it's the desire that, that if you know Jesus, it's to become more and more like Him. The membership covenant that's there in your worship bulletin is just a reminder that we have responsibility to help each other to become like Jesus Christ. We can harm that relationship with Christ by our disunity, by not praying, by not giving, by not supporting, by not doing the things that are right there on that, that membership covenant. And by the way, if you're a guest here and you go to another church and all, those things that are in that covenant all be commitments that you make to that family of God wherever you participate too. Because they're biblical things that say, I am a part of the ministry of God in this community. To do that, you need to examine your relationship with Jesus again, don't you? Do you know him? I mean, do you know him? Do you believe that Jesus died for you because he loves you just the way you are? And that then because he comes into your life, he wants to make you in a new person and ultimately take you to heaven to live with him forever. In the meantime, he wants you to serve. And what is it that he wants you to do? How does Jesus want you serving him? And maybe, and I want you to stop and just pray for a moment. What would I love to do for Jesus? Not what would Bill love to do, what would you love to do 
for Jesus. Go ahead. Everybody, just close your eyes so you're not looking at anyone else because <laughs> it's not anybody else's job. What's, what's the job you would like to do for Jesus? You might say, well, I, I, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to do something, but I'm afraid. I don't know if I know how. Well, good. Then that's something you want to be equipped for. What would you like to do for Jesus? What I'd like you to